I'm very pleased to welcome you here on behalf of the <coughs> Charleston group. I'm Joyce Dixon-Fire. I'm um, coordinator of collection development and academic librarian um, at the Tau University. Um, I uh, have been an academic all my life before I transferred into life science. And so um, I tend to be on that side. <laughs> and so I am not um, like you because I know I don't have your experience in life science. So I am always in a position to learn from you rather than because I know that most of you have a lot more experience in life than I do. Today, I was asked to, to talk about a book um, of which you have a copy of. Um, it's by David Dumont. I tend to pronounce his name in the French, but it is <laughs> David Durand, and he wrote, a book, he wrote a book entitled Reading in the Digital Age. And I'm going to talk to him about it because the, the topic has, in the recent past, become very controversial. And for several reasons, we have, we have emerged in our age uh, a series of questions and a series of factions and even cliques about people who believe that either reading is good for you or um, the devices are not good for you, on screen is bad for you, and vice versa. So I'll be asking um, David a few questions. And at the end, I will have about 15 minutes where you will now have the window of experience to bear and then ask him, fire him first. Um, and well, out of the goodness of his heart, he's going to sort of um, annotate your words, sort of sign them for you. <laughs> so you can do the line. So yeah. Is it, if anyone like like it sign, sure. sure. They, but yeah, they, they would like it. But as my introduction, the interest I had in, in reading at all was what sort of got me into this because I sent in a proposal uh, in which I wanted to look at reading um, in the digital age. Um, and, and, and I must confess that I, from my background, I believe in deep reading and, and I believe that um, a little learning is dangerous. And so I felt that with the tendency of the new st uh, students to skip, I felt that something was shifting in my, in my arena. And so I decided to sort of send a proposal about reading in the digital age. And then Katina said, well, somebody just wrote a book, and I'd like you to sort of work with him. So, um, With the advent, with the advent of um, electronic devices, and you have to say that the internet has created a very um, rich, if nothing else, textual environment. And we wonder what the fate is of someone who cannot read. So I assume from, the, from that point, that um, the text-rich internet um, enriches and also um, promotes literacy. What do you think? Um, I mean, yes, Stuart. I mean, obviously, I mean, I quote uh, when, we, when I wrote an article on this topic for the Library Journal Portal a couple of years ago. My co-author and I quoted uh, Barry Call from something he wrote a few years ago that the internet is essentially a text-saturated environment. And it's, I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, yes, the internet is heavily text-based, but it's one of the points I tried to make in this. I uh, tried to make in my previous writing to this topic and in this particular year is that. 
text isn't necessarily interchangeable because that format matters. So um, you know, reading text isn't necessarily the same off the of computer screen as it is off of a printed page or off of a smartphone or off of a tablet. And that the format actually does make a difference. And so up so that <coughs> Format does make a difference, and if uh, the nature of the technology sort of shapes the way we think about reading, it shapes the way we read. We read differently. We tend to read differently off of a computer screen as opposed to reading differently off of a printed page. And that doesn't mean you can't read at length off a computer screen necessarily, or that you you only read at length off a printed page, but the technology tends to be conducive, so that essentially that, that's one of the key points here that I've tried to make in my previous writings. And it's not my point, it's a point that people who study this topic, like popular writers like Nicholas Carr, and the scholars like Naomi Barron and Marianne Wolf have made, and I'm simply kind of amplifying it for a broader audience that the internet is text-based but it does something Nicholas Carr used a really interesting phrase when he wrote his 2010 book called The Shallows which he which is a book that really influenced how the way I look at this topic is that the internet takes all of these previous formats it absorbs them and it remakes them in its own image and that you know, the internet has text, it has video, it has audio, it has all of these, takes all of these formats, it absorbs them and it sort of remakes them in its own fashion. And so, for that reason alone, the, you know, I'm not trying to say, don't look at the internet. This isn't, this isn't, a, this isn't, my argument is not, I feel a Luddite argument. It's not, it's not saying never engage in digital reading. It's saying that format does matter and that when you tend to engage in digital reading, it's, it is a different phenomenon from reading off a printed page. And it encourages you to think and to read in a different way. And so if you're not aware of that as it's happening, if you're not aware of the distinctions, you know, that's, it can have an impact both on us as individuals and on us as Okay, I threw that in so that you could say exactly that. I wanted to ask you um, what your profession is. Okay, I am a, uh, <clears throat> my official job title is Federal Documents and Social Sciences Librarian at uh, James Yadkin Joyner Library, East Carolina University. Uh, a couple of my colleagues are here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I've been a librarian. I've been at Joyner since 1999, believe it or not. I can't believe it, but nonetheless, <laughs> there it is. I, <clears throat> I uh, in addition to my, I went to library science school at the University of Michigan, uh, the first class of the School of Information, where we got to be happy, awarded the Masters of Science in Information, which mine says parenthesis, Library and Information Services. So whenever I write it out, I write out MSI parenthesis LIS just because I can. Uh, and I also have an academic background prior to librarianship in history. I actually have a master's, a bachelor's degree in history, and then a master's degree in history, uh, specializing in Russian and Soviet history. I graduated with my master's in 1993, which was a very bad time for to try to get a job in Russian and Soviet studies, but uh, I was either five years too late or 20 years too soon. <laughs> but uh, so I have an academic background in history as well as being a librarian, <clears throat> and that obviously influences my <clears throat> excuse me. That influences how I look at reading. It also influenced how I approach this particular this particular work, this this briefing, because. I kind of approached it in the terms of historiography. I wanted to uh, 
summarize the arguments that have been made, summarize, mention the people who've made those arguments, summarize their arguments, and then kind of draw a synthesis based on that. So my, this, my background in history kind of, as I said, it influences not just how I approach this, but how I, I actually write about it. So, is that? Well, the reason for asking is that uh, I was provoked by the, the picture, this picture. Okay. This picture. Um, it's a book with wings. Why did you use it? Um, what's the, what does it mean to you? And what's the essence of it? Because when I saw it, it took me from one field of knowledge to another. And what, what did you mean by it? Oh, uh, that's Where is prob that? yeah. This is probably going to be a very disappointing answer, but I, I actually didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> So in, in this version, in the, in, the, in the version that I was given by, by Katina, I think it was it came out of the okay. print. Oh, sure. It came out of the print. I had in the front page, I had a picture of a book. Oh, okay. With me. Okay. And as I saw it, I thought that it sort of harkens back to the background of the writer or whoever created <coughs> it, because it puts it in the classics. And when I look at it, does anybody have anything, any idea? I put it in the classics because you all know about a little learning is a dangerous thing and the paella and spring. You have to drink deep, otherwise you'll come out intoxicated. But in this particular case, what it's saying, it is talking about knowledge. That knowledge doesn't begin to talk about itself, only at the end of the process. And Hegel put it very clearly when he said, um, the owl of Minerva opens, spreads its wings only at the beginning of dusk. That is what that told me. The owl of Minerva, Minerva is the goddess of wisdom, that you only begin to have wisdom at the end of the day, when you have toiled all day and we begin to get wisdom only in the evening. Mm. So that puts, if you, when I saw it, I knew that it was, I knew that it was, it was a particularly, it was a, taking a position. And that was okay. why I, I felt provoked by it. Okay. <laughs> but, I'm so looking at it from the internet, I'm going to come back to the first question. Sure. In terms of the digital and in terms of the print. What has the hour of Minerva what to do with it? Okay. Um, just, uh, just to sort of, um, that'll lead me back to essentially summarize kind of the, the basic point that uh, people who tend to be skeptics of uh, digital reading yeah. make. And that is that, and it gets back to the point I made that format makes a difference. That reading off the printed page, reading off the digital screen are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of evidence, anecdotal and scholarly, that indicates that reading off a printed page tends to, bless you, tends to uh, foster what's been called tabu, I'm sorry, foster what's been called linear reading by Christopher, a scholar named Christopher Lowe, just Christopher Rowe uses this term, linear reading, which is you read, essentially you start at the beginning, you read up, you read it word for word at length, you, you reflect on it, you think about it, you, you analyze what you've learned, you absorb, essentially what's also been called deep reading. You, you reflect, you think at length about it, you read word for word, in-depth reading. Uh, the digital reading environment, based on, again, a lot of scholarly as well as anecdotal evidence, tends to foster what's, been, what's called tabular reading. And tabular reading is what you, essentially is sort of a purely functional reading. You, you, in some cases it can be like skimming, you just, uh, you browse, 
like reading web pages, for example, analyses of when you read a web page, you essentially engage in a form of power browsing. You skim, you have what's called the L shaped pattern. You read line to line at the top of the web page, and then as you scroll down, the L, you know, the pattern gets narrower and narrower, and you just you, you're basically just skimming at that point. So you're you're basically just looking for small pieces of information or you're just browsing. So you're not really thinking about it. You're not really absorbing and thinking in depth. And that does not mean it doesn't mean that you, you don't you can't read in tabular fashion off the printed page because believe me I do a lot of it. And so and it doesn't mean that you can't if you're disciplined enough and you force yourself, it doesn't mean you can't read in linear, in depth fashion off your digital screen. But again, it's, it's the nature of the technology. The nature of the print codex encourages linear, in-depth reading in a way that reading off the most digital reading technology does not. And so, and sort of tying it back to the concept of the owl of Minerva and sort of wisdom and, and knowledge. Uh, and again, it's this concept that you reflect, you absorb, you analyze. Uh, I mean, you think about the terms that people use when they talk about digital media and using digital media. You use terms like consume, devour, binge on digital media, as opposed to terms like, again, reflect, absorb, you know, read, think about. And, and I think that that's indicative. I think that's indicative. And, uh, in terms of knowledge, again, and one of the, the things that I worry about is the sense that you don't really need, the sense that people don't really need to memorize things anymore. You just, you can just go to Google and look something up, so you don't have to actually memorize facts anymore. Knowledge is built on memorization. You read, you work, you, you, you absorb certain facts, you, you memorize them. You incorporate them into essentially what are called cons certain conceptual frameworks you have built up in your long-term memory. And that's how knowledge develops. Knowledge is built on memorization and then taking what you've memorized and putting it into these broader conceptual frameworks. So, and the, there's a lot of concern that in the digital environment that that process of memorization and the building of broader conceptual frameworks, that's hindered. And so that's one of the main points of digital skeptics. People like Nicholas Carr, uh, Naomi Barron, and Marianne Wolf tend to make. That's one of their main concerns, and I, I do share those concerns. Yes. Well, in fact, um, one of them, I think it was um, Wolf, who said young people, they call them digital natives, young people immersed in technology all their lives um, imbuing them with sophisticated technical skills <coughs> and learning preferences, um, uh, which traditional education is unprepared for. That traditional education meaning that these um, di digital natives who tend to skim and not read in depth uh, uh, tend to come out as people who were. In the, in, in the academic arena just to snatch um, some knowledge. So they leave with a smutting of knowledge. So that is the, that's, a, that's what the, the, the pessimists felt. The pessimists felt that today's youth <coughs> tend to scheme, the scheme and they sort of read in a tabular fashion, do that, make um, um, deductions without the benefit of the kind of reading traditional kind of reading that sort of fosters um, uh, a sense of um, reflection. You reflect and you tend to, you allow yourself to time to go back, to come back and reflect and think. Um, and so they feel that the act of reading on the screen is pretty good, but it is jeopardized by that facility. So coming back to the hour of Minerva, I, I think that what do you think um, of today's 
inability in terms of um, across the board, which is not a fault, um, um, that there is in the academy a loss of cognitive skills, an erasure of cognitive skills. Do you think that um, it is too soon? Because that is what the owl is also suggesting. You, you are not in a hurry to do something. You have to wait until the evening so that before you take flight. Do you think that it is too soon to talk about the erasure of cognitive skills in the digital, digital age? I mean, in terms of just talking about it, no, I would say definitely it's an issue that we need to think about very carefully. Uh, I mean, again, it's students have always sort of had an issue. I remember back, back to when I was a student, you know, you've got other things going on. And I mean, just when I was a public service librarian, I can't remember how many times I heard, uh, uh, I mean, I have a paper and it's due tomorrow and I just need to get started. So that sense of procrastination has always been there. But the problem with the digital environment is that it's sort of, yes, it lets you find a lot of information quickly, but it also, the downside of that is it fosters things like a sense of immediate gratification that you, you want, if you can't find it right away, you're not interested in it. It, it fosters uh, a desire to basically just skim, to, to just uh, get what kind of just make sort of the surface skim, get what you can and go with that. And again, that's not completely new behavior for students, but I think it's magnified in the digital age because the technology, the technology, digital reading technology tends to encourage that. Uh, the nature of the web, the nature of uh, smartphones, and more and more digital reading is being done on smartphones. And not just not just a web skimming, but also but also reading actual reading of, of longer text as well. And so again, I think it is. I think worrying about the cognitive skills because tabular reading matters. It's important. I'm not trying to say you know tabular reading is bad. Like I said, I do plenty of it myself. But tabular reading, sort of skimming, power browsing, looking for just for certain key points, is most effective when it's done on a foundation of knowledge, when you have the ability to engage in linear reading, when you've developed some sort of base conceptual frameworks, and then when you tap or read on top of that to supplement and to flesh that out, that's, that's why I think it matters, and that's why I, I think we do need to, to be concerned about it. And I cite a uh, number of scholars who mentioned uh, just anecdotally that their students, well, you know, our students won't, we can't assign full books anymore. Our students won't, won't read them. We have to just assign chapters. Well, that brings me to the next question. Because <clears throat> all three of your, of the, of, of Wolf, Wolf and the two others um, agree on one point that this tabular reading, which has its own merits, um, um, is flawed because it promotes distraction. They use that word in a very pejorative way, meaning that the students who sort of read in that particular tabular form come out with a, 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 they come out with a, a, a false sense of knowing, and that expression is used variously by most of them. And I wanted you to talk about the concept of destruction, the, the, the phenomenon of destruction in the, in, in, in the reading today, and how and why it, it is that all the professors that you that were, were interviewed talked about the fact that right now they do not, they hesitate to give longer readings. Rather than do a poor novel, some of them would prefer to give short stories. Now, what do you think about that? Uh, I mean, in terms of distraction, that's one of the I mean, that's one of the main issues, the main concerns, and I'm sure 
most of us have come across this, this topic of distraction in the digital environment. You have your, your smartphone, which pings some sort of alarm every time you get a new text message or someone, even beyond someone trying to call you at this point. Uh, and it's there, it's in your pocket, begging for you to come and pull it out and look over, like, browse your messages or whatever, or check your email, whatever, just, just because you can. I mean, again, Nicholas Carr in the shallows used a really, again, really, really wonderful term and phrase in terms of the internet, that it seizes our attention only to scatter it. And that's kind of what digital technology is designed to do. It, it gives you, again, immediate gratification, these short bits of information that are given to you at a, and you want, and you get this little bit of information, then you want to get another little piece of information. So it fosters a sense you want what's now, you want just what you can get right away. You, you tend to get, it fosters impatience, it fosters a sort of, somewhat superficial approach. Uh, and then again, again, this when you when you read off it, most digital devices, and I'm, I'm I am accepting, I am excluding dedicated e-readers for the most part, like notes or Kindles, but your tablet, your smartphone, I mean what do you use it for most of the time? You browse the web, you check your emails, you uh, you watch funny cat videos, um, so on, so forth. Yes, you play games, and then you're going to take that same device that your brain has sort of conditioned itself to use for those purposes, and then you're going to try to read at length and in depth off of that, and that, that is one of the key challenges. All right, but also, um, on the news and um, in the campaigns and political campaigns, someone once said, I can walk and chew gum. In other words, that was, a, that was the, 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 the language for multitasking, that you are capable of multitasking. So are you saying, or are we saying in this work, that multitasking is not, is not a positive feature? Uh, because the younger people, when they say multitasking, they can be in class, you are they're doing your work and they are phone telling the typing, sending a text, and they are answering the phone all at once. Yeah, that's that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of research done on multitasking, and the general theme is that there's no such theme. There's no such theme thing as multitasking. It's uh, you basically just you jump around from one task back to the other, back to the other in a very rapid sort of way. So multitasking, the concept of multitasking is actually something of a myth. And there have been a lot of studies done of, of students that when you use, like, you pull out a, a tablet or a laptop or even a smartphone in the classroom, not only does it distract you, but it distracts the people around you because the digital screen is designed to grab your attention. It's designed for you to, like, look at it. That's the whole purpose of it to look at it and kind of draw your attention towards that away from the other things that are around you. And in, obviously in a classroom setting that's obviously going to be, that's going to hinder your ability to learn and reflect and absorb on what's going on in that classroom. And uh, you've had instances where, uh, I cite this both in the briefing and in a previous article I've written for Against the Brain, you had play, you know, scholar at New York University named Clay Shirky, who uh, is one of the champions of new media, champions of, uh, supports digital media because he thinks it will change how we read and how we think, and he thinks that's a good thing. But in his own classroom, starting about three years ago, I believe, he literally had to ban his students from using digital devices in his classes because there was too much of a distraction. I mean, the quote um, I believe he used was, it's a race for attention between me and Apple and Facebook, and now you lose it. So, you know, and even someone like that notices that this technology distracts you, that 
I think that's worth taking note of. Yeah, so, I, so, so am I right then in reading in this work a kind of, I, I don't want to use the word bias, but you sort of lean towards be, believing that there is a, the, the, this distracting devices sort of imp, impair concentration and contemplation. Yes. Okay. Right. But then I'd like you to make it before we leave that point. Sure. I'd like to make you to make a comment on the metaphors that were used. There was this struck me. Um, the first there are many, but this first one, this this one was the one that says that the reader felt like a jet ski driver zipping along on the surface of the sea of knowledge. Sure. Uh, that is actually from Nicholas Carr. It's All from right. a 2008 article he wrote for the Atlantic called, uh, and again, I don't know that he came up with it. I don't think he probably came up with the title himself, but the eye-catching title is Google Making Us Stupid. It was sort of the, uh, the 95 theses of this argument, of this whole debate. And it was, his point was that before, before the onset of digital technology, you could read books. You could read them at length, in depth, and it wasn't an issue for him. But now, ever since he's turned to, you know, this is 2008, so this is really before smartphones became what they are now, uh, he felt that in the digital environment, it was just, uh, he couldn't do that anymore. That the technology had literally done something to the way his his brain was working. The term he didn't use this term in the article, but he used it in his book, The Shallows, two years later. It's called neuroplasticity. That any technology you use, essentially your brain, the neural pathways in your brain wire themselves to use that technology as effectively as possible. And when you when you use that in the, in the digital environment, it rewires your brain to seek things, to engage what we just talked about, things like immediate gratification, to just sort of find what you can right away. It wires it towards distraction, and towards looking for small pieces of information here and there, at the expense of being able to stop and reflect and, and read slowly at length and in depth. Well, that so, brings me to the next question sure. about neuroplasticity, because you gave a, almost a whole chapter to it. Okay. And, and the reason <coughs> that neuroplasticity um, is something that um, concerns all of us, the human <coughs> So that, that reading is that human, and at the same time, it is, it, it is so personal. And um, um, because of that, I wanted you to sort of talk to the audience about your understanding and your thesis on the on neuroplasticity and, and see how it why this topic is so interdisciplinary, why it has so many perspectives and why it is so relevant to anyone for any discipline. Yes. Sure. Uh, and again I'm not I'm, I'm again I'm not an I'm expert on neuroplasticity. I'm simply essentially synthesizing what others have written. Yes. And because the arguments of people like Carr and Naomi Barron and Marianne Wolf, because these arguments have gained the popular traction they have, is because they really seem to be reflecting what people, many of us, have experienced in the digital environment. That our ability to, to read books, to read from, take a book, read it from beginning to end, think about it, absorb, reflect, has been hindered the more we've used digital technology. Essentially, the point of neuroplasticity for, for this, just to sum it up, the more that you use, you, you view digital screens, the more your brain essentially alters itself to, to make, to uh, accommodate that technology. And so the more your brain accommodates digital reading, reading the use of digital screens, the harder it then becomes for you to read at depth and in length off a printed page. That was Nicholas Carr's point about the whole metaphor he used about uh, you know deep diving versus jet ski and that I think that that is an issue because and that gets to the heart of it that this 
the technology, and again, this sort of gets back to like the points that Marshall McLuhan would make back in the 1960s and 70s. <coughs> that format is not simply something neutral, that format matters, and that the more we use one kind of format, the harder it becomes to use formats that require our brain to work in a different way. And so that's why it's important to be aware of these issues, to think about them, to be aware of what's going on, and to try to uh, you know, force yourself to continue to be able to engage in linear reading, as well as digital tabular reading, which, which I doubt none of us are probably are going to give up at this point. So it's a point of being able to be aware of what's going on so that you can adapt. We can adapt as individuals, and we can adapt as institutions and as a society. Okay. Well, having established that, that you, um, um, you, you actually support reading, and that you are aware that the more you read, the more um, new pathways the brain creates. And the less you read, the more you read on the screen, the more focused you are to read it in a tabular fashion. It becomes a little bit more difficult. Having done that, I can now ask you the direct question. Is a book in print less valuable than a book on an e-book? Um, again, a lot of it's going to depend on what you use it for. I mean, there are cases where, I mean, it, it varies because, for example, genre matters. If you're reading it, if you want to look at an in-depth historical monograph or a philosophical work versus, say, a piece of genre fiction, then you could probably, I mean, be perfectly fine reading the latter in ebook format. Uh, depends on what purpose you want the book for. Are you, do you intend, do you need to read it, or do you want to read it at length and in depth versus do you simply want to skim it? Do you simply want to Engage, use it for tabular purposes, find some key arguments or key facts from that work, like a reference book, for example. Uh, I mean, that's in, in a lot, that book being in electronic format, I mean, most of our reference works have migrated to e-format, and that's, that's fine because they're primarily used for tabular reading purposes, so that makes sense. But if you do want to read a work in length, at length, and in depth, and it's, a, and it's a rich enough and sophisticated enough work, that's where I feel that the print monograph still matters, and that the print codex as a piece of technology still matters, and I think that's where it's sort of the, its main purpose going forward is. Yes. To bring it to the, into the um, orbit of the librarian, um, you mentioned, and correctly too, that tabular meaning has its merits, and one of such would be in the use of databases. You go into a database and you are looking for something, and you hit the button find. It sort of filters for you, and it brings you, it compares across, and it brings you to the comment. And that is tabular meaning, and that helps. But, um, what is the effect on the profession? And I'm talking to you at, from the point of view as a collection development librarian and from the point of view of a document. Okay. I mean, the digital, I mean, obviously the digital media environment is not going away. And it's had a lot of, it, it, it's brought a lot of positives in terms of making information more readily available. You, most of us, most of our institutions have access to a lot more material than we would just in the days of pure print and micro formats. Uh, so it's not a question of uh, necessarily thinking of print versus digital. It's thinking of print and digital. Collections that combine both formats, that understand both formats, have their purposes, tend to foster specific types of use, that the print codex still has a place in terms of in-depth reading, lengthy reading, analytical reading, especially in the key disciplines of the humanities and social sciences. While 
digitally based tabular reading has its role in terms of uh, reference works, in terms of articles, in terms of even in terms of ebooks, that it can be useful for people to uh, <coughs> be able to access books electronically if they can just scan them or browse them or just sort of skim them for key points or basic facts. Or they could use the electronic version to see if they want to read it in depth and then go from there to the print, obtaining the print version. Yes, what's the importance um, um, of the digital um, copy to you um, in terms of preservation? Um, again, it's just understanding that uh, that it fosters that it's again just understanding the distinction that that thinking about our collections in terms of a variety of formats serving a variety of purposes that uh, and understanding that we can't just. You know, there, there have been proposals that uh, all North American libraries could go to primarily digital collections within 10 years. That, that proposal's been made. And my reaction basically is, yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> because I, I, we need to think, uh, I, I talk about the merits of print reading versus digital reading. I've been doing that these last few minutes. But again, I guess my main point was to get beyond sort of thinking about print versus digital and think about print and digital. So digital has its uses, the print codex still has its use, and we need to still, as librarians, I, we need to still maintain open stack collections. <coughs> that doesn't mean they have to be as large as they are now. It doesn't mean we can't continue to adapt our buildings for the demands of the digital age, but somewhere in our building, somewhere accessible in our buildings, there has to be a place for open stack print materials that people can browse, people can people can access and use. And I guess getting back to the question of digital, specifically digital materials, one distinction I don't make it in the briefing, but I've thought about it a bit, is that sort of thinking about a distinction between accessing material in digital format versus using it in digital format. Uh, you might be, I mean, a lot of the materials I used for this were in digital format, but I didn't actually use them in digital format. I would, being the reactionary that I am, I would print them out and I would read the paper copy in depth. And I, I think that's something to keep in mind in terms of ebooks is to allow the ability to to download and to print so that people, even if they access the material digitally, that they don't necessarily have to use the material digitally if they don't want to. But what if the material is deteriorating? I mean, in terms of the preservation. Yes. I mean, there's nothing wrong. I have no objection to digitizing materials for preservation mm -hmm. purposes, uh, especially but a lot of the material that you would digitize uh, tends to be like that would be special collections type materials, things like letters, manuscripts, things that aren't necessarily full monograph length. So it's the kind of material that again you can uh, might be more profitably used in tabular format depending on the needs of the user. And also, again, as long as that material, even if you preserve it digitally, as long as the user has the option to create a paper <coughs> copy of their own for it. So, so when um, uh, one of your leaders called Kathleen Hill says, um, talks about the value of the tactile experience when you're reading, she talks about the value of the tactile experience as part of the learning process um, in navigating a text. She feels that the tactile experience is important. And then she says, we do not need books. Long form texts are what matter. And the, and, the, and, the, and the container is unimportant. Well, I mean, that gets back to the, the issue of uh, 
the idea that format is interchangeable, the idea that text is text. It doesn't matter if you put it in here or you put it up on that screen, it's just the same. You're going to read it the same way regardless. And again, I think there's enough information and enough research that's been done to show that that's not necessarily the case. So, one of the points I make in terms of discussing the debate of uh, digital skeptics, as I call them, versus supporters, ardent supporters of digital reading and digital formats, is that there tend to be two essential types of people who support, who've made the case for digital reading. One is people who say that essentially format is irrelevant, that you can just take the text, put it up on the screen, it's the same thing, it's okay, it doesn't matter, so you can save all the space and get rid of all that you know, annoying dead tree pulp and all that. So, uh, there's also a second school of thought, though, that does accept that digital reading, reading in the digital often digital devices is different but they argue that that'll actually be a, that's actually a good thing, that will be a positive, that will create new forms of thinking and new forms of reading, that will actually be an improvement on the age of print reading, what we have, the, the technology of the print codex. And uh, I mentioned Clay Shirky as an example of that. Uh, there are several others, Kevin Kelly, who was, I believe, the founder of Wired Magazine, is another very famous example of that school of thought. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, again, that's the, just to kind of go so, back to your question. So am I right in assuming that you are on the side of caution because you believe that digital literacy is important, but you prefer to marry the two rather than separate them? Yeah, I think that's probably a good way to put it. I mean... Could you repeat what you just said, please? Yes. Some people advocate for the removal, the removal of digital yes. And he feels that there is a halfway road. So I'm asking that for my reading, I have a feeling, and I, I'm asking, asking whether I'm right, um, that he, is, uh, rather than replace it, he is one person who believes that these should supplement, complement each other, that there should be a kind of synergistic, um, um, Relationship, a symbiotic relationship between the two collections. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's, I mean, that's yes. very well, much my position. Well, what, I'll throw it out now. What is the implication? What are the implications for the collection librarian? For the, for the, for the librarian? Now, don't forget that in the present day, the universities are saying that the, the, um, the like, um, books are not important and that even the librarians are saying that books are dying and uh, out. And so we should not buy any book, any, any, anything in print. We should, we, should, we should reduce the amount of, the number of books that we buy in print. The, every time that there is a shortfall in the budget, the ax falls on the acquisitions budget. And so um, what is it, what is in it for librarians? What is the risk for librarians? And I'm throwing it out to the experienced people. What is the risk for librarians? What is the risk of, for, the, of the, for the profession? Because um, not all books are born native, native um, digital. Some of them have to be written first. But then in the university, in the academy, for you to make the professorial status, you have to have published a book, more than one. It has to be a book, a tactile book. And the second book has to be something which is away from your dissertation or something. It has to be a book. But most of the time, when you, if you submitted something digital, they frown upon it. What is the implication for you? Okay. Do you want me to answer? Yes, first, and then <laughs> <laughs> give it them time to think. Okay. Okay. I mean, I mean, you're right. Especially in certain disciplines, especially the humanities and social sciences, some of the social sciences. Is, uh, a predilection towards uh, the print monograph as a preferred, not just a preferred way of reading others' research, but of producing your own research. And that tends that tends to be reflected in terms of tenure decisions and things, matters like that and evaluations. So, Again, we need to be careful. We, we need to avoid a one-size-fits-all approach. I mean, the, 
like the STEM fields, for example, most of them are much happier with a purely digital environment. Uh, there have been a number of academic libraries in the United States that have gone virtually 100% digital, and almost all of them are science or engineering libraries. Yes. But what happens in the liberal arts environment? That's what we need to be aware. That's what we need to understand differences between disciplines, differences between individuals. Some people are perfectly happy with digital reading. Others, like myself, or you know, feel are much more comfortable reading the reading the print codex for certain uses. Uh, we need to be aware of uh, again thinking about these differences between print as a format, between digital and digital as a reading format understand in terms of build our collections in such a way not that we you know cancel all our databases or anything like that which obviously is going to happen but think in terms of again integrated collections uh, meeting the needs of all our users all our disciplines students staff and faculty uh, understanding that even many of our students even though it might not necessarily be reflected in usage statistics, they do express a preference for print. There are, there are surveys that show that undergraduates, the majority of undergraduates, prefer the print codex as a means for when they want to do in-depth, long-form reading. Now, how often do they actually find the time to engage in in-depth, long-form reading? That's another question, but we have to be at least willing to give them the option and to encourage them to do that when it's in their best interest. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who would have a contrary uh, opinion? Yes. Okay, what about the ability for digital though to embed links and embed photographs that is very hard for the print monograph to do, especially like you can easily get color on your newspaper in digital format, but you don't when you get it in <coughs> I mean, those can be useful additions. But at the same time, there's also research that shows that if you add too much of that to a test, it actually takes away from the test. And it, it, uh, it hinders the ability. People get so caught up in looking at the images and seeing the links there, just, you know, the, obviously the links, the hyperlinks there, they stand out in terms of text. So they, they, they can distract from the actual text itself. And that's where, I, again, I would come up with, propose that uh, it shouldn't be thinking about, that's where you should think about print and digital as complementary, not necessarily as conflicting formats. You should have a, a print version of the monograph, perhaps a print-on-demand version of the monograph if people want to go that route, or the ability to print by chapter. Or you can have, and in addition, have the digital version and you can have things on there like links and images if people want that kind of material to supplement it or to go further beyond what's simply in the print on the ground. So that's where, I, that's where I would say that, you know, not necessarily think about it either or, but think about the ways that print media and digital media can actually complement each other. Uh, how can many, serve, yes. okay. meet different needs. So, um, sorry, I'm standing up because I can't see you <laughs> from where I'm sitting. So, um, my name is Mary Lynn Raish. I'm from Georgetown Law Library. So, a few years ago, I wrote a piece for the Syracuse University Law Review about a particular type of codex that's in the law discipline. And I would say I, I agree with complementarity. However, I, I'm not feeling as comfortable as I might about the approach that I guess we're, we're taking here. And I think it's because I see librarians as becoming more curatorial, more like people in museums. And I'm not saying museums because museums are where you put old, dusty stuff. I'm talking about a particular approach to materiality in research. So for example, if we look at this from the perspective of the history of the book, as that particular, it's now a field, history of the book, we actually end up having to think about what were the other technological changes. We went from an oral culture to a written culture, then from a written culture to a print culture. 
than to a mass print culture, you know, the technology of printing itself, and so on. And I think that from that perspective, um, we, we gain a little bit of um, balance, I guess, in how accepting, <coughs> excuse me, how accepting we are of those formats. And so, for example, you had mentioned Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan's ideas, one of his ideas, um, was that, and he only knew television, he didn't even know the internet, even though amazingly it sounds like he knew it. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of coming full circle to uh, a knowledge base that is more like an oral culture. Okay. And what's fascinating to me about it is it's also becoming somewhat tribal. So interestingly, we can communicate instantly our truths and our falsehoods and so on um, through the internet. But we did have an oral culture yes. where that was also true. It was not bounded like a codex. It was not material, it was just the sound waves of people talking. And that was the precursor of Homer's Iliad. I mean, yes. uh, the classical literature emerged out of an oral bardic culture. And in many parts of the world, there are still these oral cultures. So I guess what I'm, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable with is, um, and, the, and the article that I wrote was called Hypertext and Marginalia. Um, because I was interested in older legal texts where commentators who came later to a base text, like let's say the Code of Justinian, wrote their interpretations literally into the margins in the blank part of the book. So when you go and look at these books, it's a square of text surrounded by other squares of text. So I think this perspective is leaving out some aspects of material culture as well, such as paratextuality. Um, footnotes and intertextuality. So I think the, the whole thing is pretty complicated and I, I, I totally agree that students are now responding to something, but I'm not sure that we aren't just, we're on a journey and we're, we, we're not quite sure where we're going, but I, I'm not sure that I feel comfortable saying, well, uh, you know, the internet is a, is, is a text, you know, um, and, and uh, I, I, I can see uh, pointing out some of the dangers, but to me the dangers are sort of more existential and not only limited to how people learn. And sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. The question of politics, um, when we're, we are looking, we're working, we're working with undergraduate students, and in, in the days of scheming, they just come in and say, my professor says, give me three articles, peer review articles, and that's it. Right. But when you are working with a law student, the, 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 the discipline is inherently, is inherently academic in a different way and the students have to play with text and uh, mediate language at a different level. Mm -hmm. at a That's different, true. Yeah, at a different level. That. So that when you come, you, you get, you're teaching law and you tell the student, look at the code of Justin. It is a comparative sort of approach. Immediately you have to look at Justin, uh, Justin, you have to look at the Constantinople, you have to look at the history. I bring it all the way down for him to be able to look at the laws and how I bring it all the way to the code civil. But when you're dealing with other languages, it's quite different. And so most of the time we're dealing at that level where we are so visual and very tactile. And that, that is the fundamental difference in the text. That is why I asked him provocatively at the beginning why he used that um, bird, that owl. I wondered whether he was taking us into the classics. He wanted to take us into the classics. Yes. <coughs> So what it's worth, Jonathan Rosen's little book from 15 years ago, The Talmud and the Internet, makes exactly that, that point. That point. And he foresaw a lot of these profound historical and cultural problems at yes. the very beginnings of our time. And it's a little book, uh, little book too. I first I have to thank you, David, because I mean, you look at this conference, it's all about reading. Reading's the number one question, and there's not enough attention to it, and you've done wonderfully in, in bringing everybody's. Uh, and I'm to, the, uh, you know, I'm to the right of you on this. I can't wait this out. I can't do. But one thing I'm curious about, and I, again, you're, you had to approach this from the perspective of many different kinds of readers. Yes. Young people, students, general people. Yes. Thing. And uh, I'm interested myself in questions of scholarly reading. And, and that's what librarians are largely, not exclusively, cool but they're largely interested in the degree they work with the faculty mm -hmm. and promote, promote research. Um, and what I'm curious about is your response to these projects over the last 20 years or so 
that recognize what you're, the argument you're making and seek to split the difference in some way. That is to capitalize on hypertext, on multimedia ways. They, they wind up online. That's inevitable. They often have a print uh, demand. Let me give you an odd one that's about to sure. come forward here that tries to solve the problem. Robert Darton, of all yes. people, okay, uh, has, over the, a long period of time now, tried to figure out this problem with the Gutenberg E project that largely failed as well. But the idea there was to present the work at the border, a print text that had a digital manifestation yeah. also. Now, all of a sudden, we have a renewal of these projects, these Mellon projects at some major university presses to try to recreate the next kind of digital uh, monograph. But they're, they're trying to position themselves to promote linear reading of a kind that's combined with hypertext reading. But there are other things going on trying to do this. If you know Scalar, for example, as a publishing platform, it's at the UC Holocaust Archives. It's based okay. there. It's gaining a lot of users now because it produces what has to be called like a book on a screen. It's very hypermedia rich, but it looks, it, it promotes linear reading too. I think also something like the Walt Whitman Archive, or sometimes people call those databases, but that's misleading there. But the Walt Whitman Archive, or the Blake Archive, promotes linear and tabular reading at the same time. So I'm curious about where you see these different projects, whether there's some prospect while we promote print. Uh, I, let me finish the Darton story. Okay. So Darton mounted this, it, when it retired at Harvard, he's got a huge website now in which he put all of his research, which was very handsomely done. Harvard gave him a crew of graduate students to do it. And he, for a year, he's referred to this as a book on, you know, and now it turns out in January, Oxford's going to publish a book with a dust jacket. And print and pages. He doesn't want to give up on print. But what his image is that people will own the book and use the website. Somehow they will figure out a, a configuration at the border of digital and print reading. How feasible that is for people, I don't know. Anyway, what I'm asking about, if we add up these different kinds of things, are we headed towards some mutual accommodation here in a format we can't quite see that will that will maintain or, or, or sustain a lot of what you say about linear reading, but with advantages that come from digitalization? I mean, that's, that's a very good question. That's the key question, and I'm afraid that I don't know how, how very good it is. Very good. I don't know how much of an answer I can give you. Uh, I think it'll, I think efforts like the ones you're describing are, are worthwhile. I, I think that I've recognized the distinction and format and try to exploit the advantages of each in a way that sort of supports the other. I don't know. I mean, to a certain extent, I, I, I tend to look at attempts to replicate the print book in a digital environment to, to plus you, completely replicate it as a sort of trying to reinvent the wheel. So I, I'd almost rather see efforts to that sort of uh, reflect these differences and try to combine them or, or synthesize them in some way. It's, uh, <coughs> but as far as what that'll actually look like when it, <coughs> if it ever comes to fruition, I, I certainly don't know. Well, in your last chapter, you talked about reading as a positive um, 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 development, all the positive developments, and you sort of put in someone who was hopeful uh, uh, in that there will be a new experience, and that you said, the, you said the experience of reading books will be displaced by other better experiences, that, that another format, something will emerge which will be able to marry the attributes of the oral, the written, the digital. And, but I must say that um, it is not altogether novel because when um, you're doing deep research and you're looking at all those older manuscripts, sometimes when you go to the, the only library that may give you, we go to Houghton at Harvard, you, when you get in there, you have the text in front of you, but you need the marginalia, you need the paratext, you, so that you have to call them to come with, an, with a magnifier to look at what is written in the margins. <laughs> and just last, um, June, I was there, I'm um, walking with my book, and there was something which this person had written. This was an old book by a reading 19th century, that's my area. And there, this person um, wrote something 
and I couldn't read it. So I had to ask for the, the, the librarian. And they, she, they had, she came in and she couldn't read it, so she had to call the cubicle. And she couldn't, he couldn't read it, so they had to call somebody who read French. And this person wrote something in the margin, and it was Arabic. The reader wrote the, the comment in Arabic, and it was a very important comment. Which sort of, he, I think he put the, put the thing in the margin for some reason, I don't know. So the paratext is also very important. But when you're dealing with an, an, a, a four-year college, a, 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 a college where you have younger students who are not going into the disciplines, who are not deep into the classics, you always have to sort of scale a little bit on that level. That is why this will not answer all the questions. But one thing that's hopeful and at the end is that there will, will hopefully, something will emerge that will sort of combine all the attributes. Another thing that you said, which, and which you could talk about, sure. and she talked about the oral, yeah, um, the oral um, nature of some of our writings. And <coughs> so, some of us come from oral cultures. What is the attribute, what is the most important attribute of the oral, of the oral tradition? What is it? What is that kernel that holds the oral tradition together? Why does learning take place? even though the, the, the tradition is not written? Well, to answer the last question first about okay. oral tradition, the key point is that I think in terms of uh, past oral cultures, pre-print oral cultures versus the sort of oral culture we may be heading towards today, previous oral cultures were built on memorization. And that's the key thing. I mean, Homer, you could, he could recite that Often he could recite the whole Iliad, the whole Odyssey from from in here. He could he had it memorized, and many of his listeners could memorize it themselves. That in the digital environment is is what's in question. Our ability to memorize that's one of the, the main concerns. That our ability to memorize is under threat in the digital environment. So that's why I think perhaps the digital oral cultures will be much different and raises cause for causes for concern in terms of, as opposed to a preprint oral culture. Uh, I would also mention that uh, in terms of the nature of the change, I mean, you're, we've evolved, as you mentioned correctly, we've evolved from uh, uh, oral to, to written to print to mass print culture. Those changes unfolded much more slowly than the changes we're seeing now have unfolded. So things are changing much more rapidly, and I think that's another factor to keep in mind. That the, the nature of digital, in the digital environment, has it's, it's come upon us much more quickly, and the changes it's produced are unfolding much more rapidly than we've seen with previous changes in terms of uh, in terms of morality and literacy. To borrow what Tom is called title. Uh, in terms of the first part of your question about. Uh, you know, print texts that have things like marginalia. In that case, I mean, obviously we want to preserve that print text because in and of itself it's important. Any any text that has a sort of marginalia in it, notes within it, that in itself, not just the text, the actual text of the work, but all that added material makes itself makes that work itself a primary source document. And so yeah, by all means, print needs to be preserved with that. And, and even if some solution is found that some digital technology that completely integrates, that completely brings about, a, brings all the attributes, positive attributes of the print codex into a digital environment, there will still be print materials that need to be preserved because they are valuable primary source materials. And I think this is the type of material that will fall within that. Well, I'm like, oh, yes, go ahead. Do you have any opinion about audio books? Uh, I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I don't personally use audio books, but if, if people, if that's people's preference, well, okay, so it would be it. It would seem to me that they often interpret the text that otherwise would be up to the reader to interpret by hmm. how the, the speaker speaks the words. Um, that's, that's a good point. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm really interested in your opinion about textbooks because my understanding is that the major textbook publishers are moving it electronic only, mm -hmm. and those 
books require intensive concentration. Yes. They're not browsing, reading, and um, what's your opinion about textbooks on uh, the evolution they're making? I think it's important, I mean, the textbook issue is many, there's several key factors. One is the obvious one is the cost to our students. So we're actually doing open educational resources at my institution, and you know, I've been involved in that, I support it. But there has to be, at the same time, students have to have the ability to read the textbook in print if they so choose. I think it's important not to, we have to give them choices. We have to give our users choices. And we have to give them uh, the ability to choose the format that works best for their own needs. And well, encourage them to, and not just sort of create a, uh, not make their own choices for them by limiting them. Well, my understanding is Thompson Reuters is going much on and on But you could also argue that um, you ask for these books to be, um, in, um, in the books to be um, produced electronically and digitally. But then when the students come, they realize that the human eye can only read so many hours on the books on the screen. And so they come back and ask you, in addition to the cost of licensing, buying, and all that, they ask you to give you that book in print. They ask you to print this. They end up printing out the things. Sometimes they do. And so it ends up to become productive. That's what's going on in the movie. 